if you're holding a view that is the opposite or different to experts on that topic, you're probably wrong having that kind of humility. How does that work? Like, let's say, let's take a real world example, something that's kind of in my sphere and in nutrition, vegetable oils or seed oils. So the guidelines and recommendations certainly advocate for consuming more plant-based oils or vegetable oils over saturated fats and have for quite some time. But if you were to say, is my view aligned, and I'm not talking about me, I'm just talking about anyone who's thinking about this topic, is is my view aligned with experts? You will find experts online who think that seed oils are toxic and then you'll find experts online who think that they should be consumed instead of saturated fats. So which experts are you cross-referencing? Choose your expert, yeah. So that's where it comes to like no single expert is an authority, right? No single person is an authority. No small group is an authority too. There are also like, you know, these small groups of scientists who all believe the same thing or, you know, not necessarily scientists, but, you know, people who are uh, operating in this space. So you have to to say, well, first of all, sometimes scientists are going to disagree, and that just means that we're uncertain, or it's genuinely controversial, or maybe it's not genuinely controversial, and these are outliers. Is there a strong consensus and an outlier, or are there two equally valid schools of thought here? And how do you know? You got to talk to an expert, to, you know, or you got to be an expert, or you got to read someone who can distill that for you, who you trust. You know, again, there's no simple, it's no simple hack. There's no one rule of, that, of thumb or that you could do. Like each situation is its own thing that you have to, to invest time in. How much time? Well, how much is it worth to you? You know, but at least, you know, like one expert can be absolutely wrong. Right. And even if they're right about everything else, like I know experts who are who are aligned with the broad consensus on most things, but they have this one thing where they're an outlier, where they just believe this one thing for whatever reason that just conflicts with the with the prevailing consensus. So you have to that's again being a critical thinker, being media savvy, being you know scientifically literate means you know to ask the question. All right, I know there are you could find experts who will believe anything. So that in and of itself is not valuable. That you found an expert who believes something doesn't mean anything. You have to have a way of evaluating the consensus of scientific opinion. Is there a consensus? What is it? How strong is it? How uni uniform is it? Are there outliers? Are there minority opinions? Are they valid? Sometimes the minority opinion becomes the dominant opinion, but or is this are this really just cranks who are really far out of you know they're out of the mainstream? How confident are the consensus experts that the outliers are wrong. You know, you have to ask all those questions or talk to somebody who has the ability to ask all those questions and distill it and summarize it for you. Um, there is no shortcut. There's no, sh there's no shortcut there. You got to do the work, you know? And yeah, it's a complicated world. There's no easy answer. Sorry. I like, there's, I can't give you like, Oh, do A, B and C and they'll get to the right answer. It's like, no, you gotta, you gotta go through the process, you know? Right. I can imagine people are listening and, and I've probably fallen into this line of thinking before where you just have resistance to this idea of the population at large becoming more scientifically literate. You don't think it's realistic, but then the question is, what is the alternative? Yeah. The alternative is, is, is not pretty. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, remember, I started doing this before the internet revolution, you know, I mean, lived through a lot of changes and the, you know, social media and the internet really has created a different world in very bad ways. You know, the information, and I mean, in, in some good ways too, I do think that people are more knowledgeable, more factually knowledgeable than they were. We have access to a lot of information. There's, you know, the social media has allowed talented science communicators, scientists to communicate directly to the public and the public has access now to all kinds of fantastic high quality information. If you want that, if you want to, if you are interested in educating yourself about science and critical thinking and all these things, it's all there. It's all distilled for you, packaged 
in multiple formats, video and audio and books and articles, it's all there. That's great. But it's buried under this mountain of misinformation and pseudoscience and nonsense and commercial speech and all kinds of things that are trying to lead you astray. So right now, the most important tool anyone could really have is the ability to sort of sift through the nonsense to the real information and have some way of telling the difference. Right. That's really the most important skill you can have in today's world is the ability to tell what's real from what's not real, what's reliable and valid from what's not reliable. And so that's what I think when we talk about we want to this to be baked into education. That's what we're talking about. Not what's happening today, you know, in public school, unless there's a good, you know, some science teachers can do it, you know, and a lot of them do do it. And you have good science teachers out there who are teaching critical thinking, but it's not baked into the curriculum, like teach like civic scientific literacy, civic critical thinking skills, like your ability to participate in society, to survive in this ecosystem of misinformation should be baked into K through 12 curriculum and should be baked into every science course. And that's partly part of what we're trying to do is re-educate the scientists and the academics out there who like don't want to teach pseudoscience. Like, no, you have to teach the pseudoscience. It's not this messy thing you don't want to deal with. You have to teach it. You have to teach your students how to recognize it, how to recognize science denialism, how to recognize pseudoscience. Otherwise, you are sending them out naked in front of the wolves. You know, you're not preparing them for the real world. If you maybe you're preparing them for the ivory tower, and then even there, it's not really enough. But you're certainly not preparing them for the real world without te- without telling them how to identify pseudoscience and science denialism and conspiracy thinking and why it's wrong, you know, why it, you know, how it operates, all of those things. If you don't do that, you know, then you haven't done your job, right? And y- no matter how many facts you give them, it's not enough. It doesn't help. It's not going to k- prevent them from becoming cranks you know, when, once they leave your classroom. I am absolutely excited to share an exclusive offer with the Proof community. This is a limited time offer just for my audience and no doctor referral is needed. Function Health is a comprehensive at-home blood testing service that gives you access to over 100 biomarkers, covering everything from heart, liver, kidney, and metabolic health to hormone levels, inflammation, and nutrient status. That, my friends, is five times more testing than the average physical. I chose Function for my own blood work and to be a sponsor of this show because they are the best in the world when it comes to helping you understand and own your health. It's true, the depth and quality of their testing is unrivaled. And as regular listeners of this show will know, you cannot optimize what you don't measure. Don't guess, test. Use Function to know exactly where your health is today and then intervene with evidence-based medicine and lifestyle changes to feel your best and reduce your risk of chronic disease. With Function, you get access to very important markers like LP little a, a genetically driven cardiovascular risk factor, ApoB, the most predictive marker of atherosclerosis, and LH and FSH, reproductive hormones typically missing from standard lab panels. It's not uncommon for these biomarkers and others to be elevated. For example, over 50% of Function members have an ApoB level, and over 20% have an LPA little level that is above the optimal range. You can even add on harder to access tests like cystatin C, a very sensitive marker of kidney function, as well as selenium and iodine nutrients that are essential for thyroid and overall health, yet rarely tested. So what are you waiting for? Run over to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill today and be one of 1000 listeners to score a $100 credit. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.